We'll bring this regular workshop meeting to order. Council, you have before you a copy of the proposed agenda for tonight's meeting, and I would entertain a motion at this time to adopt that agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion? Uh, with none, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. All right. Uh, we're going to do uh, some workshop topics here. Uh, the first one will be the FY20 budget, and Mr. Massey, I'm going to turn it over to you at this time. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, we uh, we'll go ahead and skip the first slide. <clears throat> As we said, the budget be the first item. Uh, when we ended our last discussion on the budget, uh, of course, we had some notes. I don't intend to go over the notes from last week's meeting unless there's a question. Okay. So we'll <clears throat> then go on and, and pick up on our discussions on employee compensation. One, just one correction there. On, on the, in the budget note, we talked about the digital sign, and we subsequently, after doing a little more checking, finding out that it, that price is too low, the uh, manager uh, proposes to just withdraw that from the budget, and we'll talk about it and get better pricing, and if we need to move forward, we'll come back uh, after we're in the budget year on that. The, uh, <clears throat> We're just going to let Gail pick up here and review some of the things we've, we've talked about before as we go into the compensation discussion. This is just the history of where what we've adopted in the budget as far as using the fund balance each year. And then the last column is what we've actually added each year to the fund balance. And our estimate is that we'll spend a million dollars this year. Um, at this time of year, that's usually what we say. Uh, so it, it's the best guess we have right now. And then FY20 right now, with all of the uh, decisions that have been made, we're balancing the budget with 2.1, which is exactly what it was last year. And then I believe Mr. Warden had asked for the history of the COLAs. Um, you can see here, one and a half percent of the last two years, $1,000 per employee prior to that, and then also the CPI. And then you had asked for the 2.2% increase amount. And this is what it would cost each fund. The general fund amount does still include the fire department because we haven't made a decision on that. It does not include the police officers who are on the step plan. And then our current proposal is the spend 2.1 million. If you add the 2.2% COLA, that will be almost 0.4. So that would have a spending a fund balance of 2.5. So um, if you're ready to talk about this now, the we need to decide what amount and then we have historically done it for folks who were hired prior to January 1 of the year. We need to know if that's still what you want to do. And then <coughs> last year we discussed moving the pay scale by half of what the COLA was. Um, there may be a few adjustments that are required to people hired after January if they were hired at the minimum. But, but yeah, so anyhow, that, those are two points that we want to confirm when we make the, the actual COLA decision, uh, if we're gonna apply it the same same way we did last year, of course, then uh, the actual 2.2% or whatever amount that council feels is the right answer. We have- uh, You're saying you're gonna adjust, if council approves the 2.2, you're gonna adjust the pace scale by half of that. Yes, sir. 1.1%. With your approval. We'll, I understand. We'll add, we'll, we'll just ship the starting salary, everybody's starting uh -huh. salary, about 1.1%. 1 .1%. Why the 1.1? 1 .1? Well, we don't, well, because, you know, we talked last year that we hadn't shifted the scale mm -hmm. uh, in a long time. And what that does is, is when you then have entry at entry level if others have moved their scale right then we're not competitive 
and and so to to main, remain competitive with the market, we do need to periodically adjust the starting salaries. Now that's not something you necessarily have to do every year, but because we went a number of years without doing that, we have sort of fallen behind a little bit in in starting salaries, and so what we're we're proposing last year, like last year, the same thing this year, sort of as a little bit of catch up with our starting pay. And then every year we'll look at it again and determine whether there's a need to make an adjustment to the pay scale or whether you just move employees through the range. I understand what you're saying. I guess the question really is, because I agree with what you're saying, why not 2.2 instead of 1.1? Well, then, then if you're not careful, you start calling, causing compression. Tom, you want to come up here? Tom's our compensation person. Tom Sherwood, you know, he's the one that looks at the market. I thought we didn't do it last year. We, we didn't. We only did half the. Okay. Did 1.1 last year? We did. Well, we didn't. We did a 2% pay raise last year. We did half of it. One and a half. And we did 0.75. So that's what All right, we're, we're being consistent. Okay. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> My question, I, I, the question I have is uh, the, the CPI that you're going by, was that the year-end CPI? It's the December. Okay. And it's at? 2.2. Mr. Mayor, I would move for the recommended increase in the COLA of 2.2% for persons who were employed uh, as of J January 1st, 2019 or later. No, I'm sorry, the other way around. Prior to. Uh, employed prior to January 1st, 2019. And you're proposing this in the way that he's describing using half, half, yeah. Half, okay. Second. Motion and a second. Discussion. Mr. Mayor, I'll move for the increase in the COLA of 2.2% for employees who were employed prior to January 1st, 2019. Uh, our next item is last year we had <clears throat> we had done we set aside three hundred dollar three hundred thousand dollar I'm sorry the fire step plan we're gonna we're gonna delay that like I said there's more information we need to gather on on the actual steps and and the cost and so the proposal is to to basically do that analysis, come back in the October or September, August or September timeframe, and that some of the, you know, as we said, the adjustments for people that would be outside the step plan are still there uh, in the in the budget. We would not adjust anybody's pay until we made the step decision, and then we would make it, and we would make that whole adjustment retroactively. To that the was first also using the three hundred thousand that was not unobligated. Is that correct? Well, that, that would be the recommendation to add three hundred thousand. Not used, so just basically rolling it over. We hadn't used it this year, so we same amount as last year, and then use that to implement the fire plan if that's what the decision is. I make a motion that we authorize that roll that 300 adjustment over and we we hold off on the pay until we get some more on the on the fire fire department until we get some more info second discussion all in favor aye, aye. aye. opposed and there was one more slide that shows we'll be using 2.8 million on balance with the if we we just voted on the 300,000 so and then there's the history of the fund balance again. Yes. Just a minor point. We had showed you in the CIP update that the price of the Gum Branch Widening Project had decreased from 384 to 296. Well, we've gotten a little revision to that, and it's 329. 
So we just wanted to know, let you know that, you know, we went down, but we're going to go back up a little bit in the final budget. Yeah, submitted for council approval. Okay. And the next thing, now that we've resolved all the unresolved issues, we're at a point where we'll be prepared for the council to, to adopt the budget at our workshop on June 4th. It'll be a, four, or a, five, a 5 p.m. meeting in a workshop setting. Okay. All right, Gail. Okay. You're done. done. Unless anybody has any questions for Gail, we'll move on to the next thing. Thank you. Okay, Lily, you want to come up and talk about CDBG, the five-year plan, and a, a, and a subject, economic mobility. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Here to provide you with an update on our five-year planning process and, as Ron mentioned, our new economic mobility initiative. Um, as you know, we have a five-year plan as part of our federal requirements to receive community development block grant funds. The purpose of that plan is to assess what the needs are in our community. We work with citizen input to identify the goals and objectives that we hope to accomplish and develop effective strategies. strategies. And I want to focus in on that key word, effective, because that's going to mean a lot when we start talking about economic mobility. And then we communicate the, these plans to our citizens. Incorporated within the plan, every year we have to have an annual plan, which basically is our budget and our plan of action, which tells HUD what we're going to do each year to carry out the objectives we have determined we need to work on for the five years. And that includes our various activities that we fund, the budget as you adopted, and then outcomes. Another key word when we talk about economic mobility. As you all know, our HUD goals are housing, suitable living environment, and economic opportunities. And we do that by serving low and moderate income households, eliminating slum and blight, and urgent need. We also go through a citizen participation process. We held six community input meetings, part of this year's uh, plan development, two funding opportunity workshops. We also conducted some surveys. We held our 30 day public comment period and some additional final public input meetings. And as you know, we were late receiving our funding allocation this year. When we did finally receive it, we received three hundred and fifty-three dollars, approximately two hundred three. And I wanted to leave that O three O four fiscal year in there. It's well over ten years, but we used to receive six hundred forty-one thousand dollars. That was the highest allocation the city's ever received in O three O four, and we're fifty percent of that today at three fifty-three. Still expected to carry out and meet the needs of the community with far less funding. So here's how we're proposing uh, to allocate the funding that we received, 352-203. We have program income of over 205 for a total uh, budget of 558. And you will receive and see the five-year plan at the next workshop and have an opportunity to adopt it. And it goes, it's required to be submitted to HUD by June the 11th. This is how we <coughs> plan to spend those funds this year, um, administration, our public improvements, which is the Georgetown bathroom and some sidewalks, our demolition, um, $50,000 for nonprofits, our residential rehab program, acquiring additional property, um, and our affordable housing down payment assistance initiatives. Now, so Ron mentioned, I want to talk to you about connected data for economic mobility. We had an opportunity, Ron and I, to attend the convening in Baltimore back um, in April, two days. There were cities and representatives from all over the country, I would guess probably 200 people there. And this was hosted by John Hopkins University, uh, GovX, and a consulting firm, UPD. What we learned at that meeting was how they were defining economic mobility, which was a study of how uh, a citizen's or a person's income increases from one generation to the next, how we change, how we measure poverty changes. And for local governments, for us, what this means is focusing on programs which help people escape or avoid property. Escape or avoid. What, we, what they're trying to do is get people to break the generational cycle of poverty. From one family member was uh, in Wilmington last week and had a conversation about four generations, for example, of uh, households that live in Section 8. 
grandmother gets it, mother gets it, the daughter gets it, and then her children. It's an ex expectation in some families, and we want to break that and let them know that there are other opportunities. And it's focusing on these domains. These are the areas that impacts economic mobility. Of course, economic development, our educational system, our health system, housing, all the human services that we fund in our workforce, workforce, quality jobs and wages, all of that impacts whether someone is able to move up economically. Why this is important for us is because there's a clear connection to the five-year plan. Again, we just read this. We want to assess the needs of the community, identify priorities, develop effective strategies, and communicate those strategies to our citizens. And we have a lot of partners that we work with. Locally, right now, we are already working with NC Serves, which is a network that's designed to serve veterans and military-connected families. NC Care 360 is coming online this year. That is a coordinated effort to serve pretty much everybody else because what the state has figured out, Department of Health and Human Services, is that health is impacted by how well you're thriving in these other areas. Whether you have quality housing, a, a job, all the stressors that come with that, education, employment. So it's all connected. And we're providing funding to nonprofits in all of these areas in some way, shape, or form in our community, whether it's directly through the city, whether it's through United Way, whether it's on state funding, somebody, even the police department, there's funding coming into this community to address these different issues. And what GovX shared with us was that the greatest barriers to opportunity occur outside the classroom. It's not just an education issue. There's access, lack of access to stable housing. There's lack of access to jobs that promise a pathway to increased earnings. Um, they need to be in a safe and healthy community, and that these are fundamental and beyond the reach of far too many people in our community and, and really in our country. So we know we have systemic challenges just right here in the city of Jacksonville. We have our home ownership program. We try to build and construct affordable housing. We are funding programs to address homelessness. We have partner agencies that are providing housing through Section 8 vouchers. We know that the chief is interested in ex-offender programs and opioids. All of this is designed to create a healthy, strong, vibrant community. Question is, do we know how well we're doing? Let me ask you a question. Yes. Can you give us an example of a city that have used NC? Was it NC Care? It's, still, it's so new. It's, <laughs> oh, it's coming online period. this year. It's just not it's here. Just Nobody's using it. Nobody's using okay. it. It's going to be in all 100 counties. Okay. We're just getting briefed on this. So this is coming. Okay. And so what we, uh, what the Economic Mobility Project is, eight, eight cities have been selected to participate in this project. It's a community-focused approach where GovX will come in and provide no-cost technical, technical assistance to the staff and to our community partners. It's funded by an organization called the Baumair Bau Group, and it's a community of practice. They want to see this implemented and replicated all over the country, similar to what we saw with NC Serves. That's another form of a community of practice where you see them all over the region and all over the um, country. And what they will do is build our community and in internal capacity to be able to really assess how well we're doing at moving people up economically. It will help us identify and address those systemic challenges that we all know we have with the intent of improving our community well-being. What they've asked us to do is for me to share this with you tonight and for Ron to share with you. And they, if we are interested as a city, they would send us an MOU, which we would ask Richard to sign with your approval. Dr. Woodruff, my apologies. It's a two-year process. It would run through the 2020. They would come in, there will be multiple site visits, multiple on-site trainings, not only with staff, but with whoever else in the community we want to invite. We know there are key partners, United Way, Coastal, the school system, um, East Carolina Human Services, our traditional partners, the homeless shelter, would all come in and have some conversations around this issue of economic mobility. And what we would walk away with was, would be the development of a sustainability plan. How do we continue to do this and assess our outcomes after they leave. It will strengthen us as a staff and will strengthen us as a community. And as you saw, saw with that federal funding going down, not just federal funding, all various pots of money are going down, are we doing what we really need to do with what we have? And are we getting the results we would really want to get as a community? So that's a quick overview of our five-year plan. We have incorporated this language in the plan. Our five-year plan has what's called an anti-poverty strategy. 
we're going to use this terminology because really it's an expansion of an anti-poverty strategy. It's an economic mobility strategy. So we'll be begin to use this language. We'll be, we will begin to communicate this language with our nonprofit partners. We have, we're already beginning to talk about training them on what we had learned when we went to Baltimore when we got the email that we had an opportunity to receive this training. So we like to delay our internal training, and if you desire and we bring in GovX and their team, they would provide the training that we would then begin to measure or, or identify how what we expect of the nonprofits that we fund, and eventually it spreads throughout the community. Ron, you want to yeah, see, GovX is, is sort of a, a section, like a center at, center at Johns Hopkins, and, and it's funded basically uh, by uh, the former mayor of, of New York City, uh, the previous mayor, Bloomberg. by his foundation. Bloomberg. Bloomberg, yes. yeah. And, and, and what their foundation's trying to encourage is getting the biggest bang for the buck. In other words, if you're trying to improve you know, life in cities and you're, you're bringing in resources from different areas like CDBG funding, and, and some of the uh, grants that we get in that. And you're trying to systematically address the issue of poverty and economic mobility, you know, get people in better housing, that you really need data to look and determine how effective you're being. And, and so what we're gonna be, what we hope that council will support is, is based on their invitation for us to participate that not only will the staff, the city staff be involved in learning this, but our nonprofit partners, the ones, the same ones that we're working with in NC serves, some of the same ones that we're working, gonna be working with with NC Care 360, some of the same ones we're giving money to in our annual private public partnerships, you know, and, and try and get us sort of rowing a little bit better together. And, and actually then measure it. Mm -hmm. Okay, did we move the needle? So, I mean, we, we don't, we see this as an excellent opportunity for us to grow and to bring our partners along with us. And it's no cost to the city other than the staff time involved in the training. And I'd like to give cr credit to uh, Tracy, <coughs> co-worker here. One of the questions she, all, she asked a lot when we're, when we're reviewing grant applications is so what? It's the difference between someone filling out a grant application and saying, we're gonna serve 500 people. What's better to say is we're gonna serve 500 people and at the end of the school year, say 500 at-risk youth. At the end of the school year, their, their grades will have gone from an average of a B to an average of a, a oh, let's do another number, from a D to an A. Say 90, say 60% of your kids come in with a D. By the end of the program, should 90% of them be at an A? That's the difference with economic mobility, is asking the right question. Not how many you serve, but how many were impacted or better in a better position after they left your program. We ask the question, how many people go through our home buyer education? Probably 25 people every other month. How many of them actually buy a house? How many of them stay in the house for 10 years? You know, those are the kind of questions it forces you to ask, are we all moving whether, whatever door they enter to get, a, to get help? Are we looking holistically? Are we just serving them now? Are we trying to serve them long term to move them? And how are we following that? And how are we designing our programs to have that kind of be, that kind of impact? I mean, when you look at you know people that are in affordable housing now, you want to find the ones who want to aspire to into home ownership. And so, with our program of basically underwriting home ownership. Mm -hmm. You know, you can get those people and hopefully migrate them out of family, out of affordable housing into their own home. And guess what? You freed up another spot in the affordable housing for maybe somebody that's homeless right now Instead and of building you need homes. to get them off the street. Okay. So, I mean, that's the concept that we're trying to sort of broadcast and, and get everybody to join in with us. We'll be better at actually identifying the problems. Right. And but, because one of the things um, on the veterans issue, they often talk about veterans homelessness, but they don't talk about the mental health aspect right. of it. Why, why are they homeless? Mm -hmm. Underemployed, uneducated, mm -hmm. you know, haven't been able to use vocational rehabilitation. 
So, so yeah, and there was another conversation I think we shared. People don't know, for example, that you can use a Section 8 rental voucher to buy a house. Same, same subsidy, but look at the different investment. If I'm going to pay a, a rent for the next 30 years, why not pay it toward a house payment and own something at the end of the process? Now you're creating generational wealth. You're leaving something. You have an inheritance. And those kind of conversations we don't talk about. So if the government is going to help me rent, why not help me buy? But what prevents someone from stepping in from rental to home ownership? A lot of it is fear. A lot of us, I never, I don't know anybody else that owns a home. I don't know if I can budget and handle my money correctly and I'm in a safety net. So there's financial literacy and education and all sorts of things that we can be doing to help people realize their fullest potential. But we don't necessarily ask that of ourselves or of our community and our community partners to take that extra step. So that's what I'm excited to have um, folks from GovX come in and help us do. See, and the thing is, it doesn't mean that the city has to do something like this. It just means we have to make sure that that is available, whether it's home buyer education courses or whatever. And so that's where our partners come in, because we may decide, hey, partner, you know, that's something you're better equipped to do than we are. So we want you to do that, and we'll do this. But, uh, I mean, so it, you are, yeah. excuse me, researching better ideas to, uh, to capture data in the community that's itself, part of right? it, Yes, that's part of what their research is designed to do and to help us understand how to capture data and help our partners understand how to capture with the end goal that it all should be and utilizing it. The right. right data, not just number served, but impact type of data. I guess one, is, are there any questions about the five-year plan? Because we'll bring it to council meeting next meeting next for next adoption. Week. And, and it sounds like we're on board with pursuing a more systematic approach to economic mobility. And is council okay with us basically pursuing uh, this disagreement and training from the... Uh, Who are the other demo cities? They have not told us. I asked that question, but I do know they're not in North Carolina. We're the only one in North Carolina. Now, I will tell you, they work with other cities on other programs. I know Fairville has worked with them, Cary, Raleigh, Durham. Uh, the so GovX, their Gov that they, GovX Center. Yeah, there, I think there's eight other cities that are working with them basically on using data to make decisions and, and things like that. I think, I think that program they call is Smart Cities. Work cities. Work cities. Work cities. Yeah, work cities. Yeah. And you can actually go to the Sometimes. website to see that. But this right. initiative is new, so we're one of the first to be, get an opportunity to participate. Lily, will there be an MOU that will yeah. actually come back to council for them to review? and Yes. Okay. Yes. They wanted to know that we were interested, and they send the MOU, and we get it to you and give you the review of that. Any other questions? All forward. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we uh, gonna have uh, our fire and emergency services folks. We we've got an opportunity to uh, to apply for a grant. We just want to get uh, council's permission. Sean, are you here? Yeah. <laughs> Sean Hayes, our assistant fire chief. Council, how's everybody doing? Mm -hmm. Uh, we're looking to apply for a grant through the Firehouse Subs Foundation. It's a public safety grant up to $25,000, 100% funding. There's no matching funds. Um, what we're looking to apply for is an ATV that has a mounted patient transport unit in the back. We'll be able to utilize that for the festivals downtown, National Night Out, Oktoberfest. It'll provide us access to the running trail. If we ever do have someone going to a medical emergency down the running trail, it'll provide us quick access. We can render medical treatment, load them all up on the ATV, and meet the ambulance on the roadway. Um, it can also be used after hurricanes to get into areas that maybe the roadways are blocked, our trucks can't get to. It'll provide us another means of access. Um, as I said, the grant will fund up to $25,000. The total quote for the unit is just under twenty-four, So it'll be 100% covered by firehouse subs. And there was a time when we were able to rely on Jacksonville Rescue to have access to a piece of equipment like that, but Jacksonville Rescue went out of business and all their equipment was basically you know, reassigned someplace. So you're just asking for permission? Just that we can go ahead and council motion. So moved. Second. All in favor? 
Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, we'll move on to the Jack M. Yet survey results. So, Susan. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, as you'll recall, I came to you back in April and we kind of went over the questions for the Jack M. Yet survey. I let you know that we were going to go door to door and get some input so that we could, you know, keep moving forward with, uh, with Jack and Yet. So uh, we did that. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on what we did and how we did it, and then basically show you what came back on them. So uh, April 8th through the 30th, we went through the end of the month. We had uh, a door-to-door, -door, basically. Most of it was a door-to-door, -door, and primarily by my staff, some part-time, some full-time. It was a, a great opportunity for us to go door-to-door -door and talk to folks and get a good opportunity to get their input. Uh, social media was also shared, uh, so we had two, two ways of getting that back. This is the survey area. Uh, that was one of the areas that was identified from a larger map as far as the city goes. And then this is um, not my best attempt, but one of my attempts to outline what we did specific to the door-to-door. -door. We deployed teams and they went from, you know, one day of completing one, two, three, four, and five of those, those sections. So we were very methodical. We tracked every house we went to, every doorknob that either somebody came to or we left an envelope. Uh, we tried to be very uh, consistent with how we went about doing it. So we had training with the staff um, prior to going to those doors. Uh, we deployed uh, basically a six person team. They split up into two teams of three and we would kind of start at the beginning of the street and then they worked their way down either side of the streets, tracking, taking notes, talking to folks, and then moving down the line. We did a variety of days, lots of day times, but also in the evenings, afternoons. Um, I was even at the school when school got out at Clyde Irwin. That was a great opportunity to talk to the parents there. And then we also hit on Good Friday since we were working, but lots of parents are out. We felt like that was a good day to get also people that might be home that day. If they were not home, we did leave envelopes in their door and we asked them to drop it off at three locations, either City Hall uh, or their apartment complex, uh, Bell Fork Homes, and um, uh, the, drawing a blank, the homes that run most of uh, town, center. town Center. Thank you, Mr. Massey. Uh, and they did drop them off. And we had several dropped off here to City Hall, which we felt was, uh, that was a good opportunity as well. Uh, we collected 406 surveys. Uh, we were happy with that. Majority of that is from the door to door. About 350 was from door to door. The majority, the left of that, 50 plus, was either online or they just got wind of it and filled it out. Um, but we got about 350 from from going door to door. How many um, did you say from online? About 50, about 50. give or take 50. We had a 406 <coughs> completed. Uh, we also wanted to get a cross-reference and, and have another opportunity at the very end of the month for anybody that did not uh, see us at their door or lived in the neighborhood, and we held an input meeting at the school, Zecca, right around the corner from the center at 6 o'clock on the 30th. We had 15 come out and attend that. They gave me feedback. It was, you know, uh, very similar to what we had heard throughout our two or three weeks out um, in the neighborhood, but then they also filled out surveys if they hadn't already. Okay, so if you'll refresh your memory, our first question was, have you or someone in your family used Jack Amiet Recreation Facility? We had uh, basically two yes opportunities and a no, they had not. As you can see, we had one before the hurricane and then sometime two years before the hurricane. Uh, cumulative, those were ironically right at the same number. Cumulative is 56 versus the 44. Feel free to stop me if you have any questions as I go along. So. Um, uh, the next question we had is what, what is, areas did you use uh, before the hurricane? What is it that you appreciated or utilized? Um, playground was number one. Uh, not surprising, we have fabulous playgrounds, but that was number one. <laughs> Restrooms. <laughs> and then it goes down the line to the indoor basketball, the splash pad, and the outdoor basketball. You can see there that they're all, uh, you know, all very much in line with the same number of percentage. I will say, in case you're trying to add these numbers up, we didn't limit them, so it wasn't that they could only answer one. So none of the answers are going to equal 100%. People had the opportunity to kind of list multiple questions. Uh, multiple answers. When you say inside basketball court, what age groups is using that, the court? 
I didn't ask. We asked who utilized it or who was in their home, but we didn't ask what ages used the indoor basketball. I'm wondering because there's not a lot of, uh, well, you can't do, you know, a lot of the middle school, high school age kids, they don't probably don't use their court because of regulation we can, issues. We can pull that data. We have a lot of that data from our Youth Night program, which is the Monday through Friday evening program, and that was geared towards the teens. And so we can pull that data. We know that majority of the open play opportunities in the evening hours was uh, 14 to 21. Let me ask you a question. Did you actually uh, get the numbers of, of children or break down of different age groups from a uh, town center? Did you actually? I did not. Okay. I, don't, I, I didn't ask them for their data on their patrons or their residents. Um, so, uh, you know, and then it goes on, you know, obviously you can see their basketball meeting room space and then none of the above. And the number, uh, you'll see it above the uh, 99 and 82, that just gives you a reference on how many people that, that actually is. The percentage is a little, con not confusing, but I want to just clarify that's in reference to how many answered. Not everybody answered it, so we did have some skipped, um, but give or take, that's what we're looking at. Okay, so this one is what programs are you likely to participate if, um, in if offered at the new Jack Emmett Recreation Center? That other uh, is a cumulative of indoor, you can see there, and then not likely to use. I'll be honest with you, a lot of that uh, probably on that question, it was about 8% of that 12% is not likely to use. Uh, but then it jumps to fitness classes, summer day camp, youth enrichment, after school, basketball, arts and crafts, educational, so on and so forth. And again, I didn't limit what they could answer on these. So they could pick multiple choices. But you can see that the top one was 181 versus 135, 107, and then down the line. Three things. Now, this one I did limit because I wanted them to have to pick and choose what were the top three things. Uh, the number one is at 143 is a gym fitness classes or weight room, uh, and then a walking track. And then arts and crafts, multi-purpose, multi-use indoor space, classrooms, kitchen, and stage for performing. Now this is what we call a word cloud. Um, it, rather than showing you another graph, basically what this does is it automatically enhances those mostly answered questions or mostly answered. So you can see here that the most responses were regarding kids, programs, classes, youth, none, a pool, um, basically the smaller, the less responses, the larger, the more responses. We just kind of had some fun with this, just so not to show you another graph, so but I have all of those did responses. Did you pull that from the other slide, the slide before that? No, this is a specific question. This, <clears throat> this question right here was specific. What one new program or function would you like to see added, um, would you like to see added at the new Jack Emmett Center? This just kind of gives us an idea of if, if we're going to redesign or look at a new right. facility, what is what does that need to be geared towards? Is it arts and crafts, for example? Is it, you know, stage? Is it those sort of things, multi-purpose space? We just wanted to get, you know, an idea from the from the users. Were your answers broken down by age classifications? I do have that in two questions, yes, sir. Okay. Can, can you go back to the slide before that? What three things would you like to see? Okay. Inside, this is um, more of a function of a building. The next question is more of a program. So what do you want the building? What are the functions of it? And then what programs would you like to see? So it gives us on that next question a little bit more idea of what programs we Because yeah, when I look at indoor, it was not as bold. And then I look at some of these other, you know, looking at this chart, like gym or weight on fitness room. That's an inside activity. Yeah, that so was I'm specific to, to the inside. Why indoor wasn't. You go to your next slide. Please. Like when I look at indoor, it, it really has no uh, not a lot of significance. Gravity, right? That's good I'm point. Thinking. Yeah, this was uh, this was geared towards a programmatic standpoint. This is good information. Honestly, the list of programs listed, I could. We're going to utilize that here or at Northwoods or at Kerr Street, because the list of programs that people like to see is valuable to us as a programming staff. Movie night, for example, we offer movie night. That makes me feel good, we offer that, or um, swimming lessons or fitness. You know, those are programmatic questions for sure, uh, that we wanted to glean from that. Yeah, I was understand that, but Jim, when I think of Jim, I think about pickleball, basketball, indoor hockey. And this was an open-ended question. They could write whatever they wanted to in there. 
I didn't gear this one towards any particular group or not. They, they could put what they want to do in that. Um, I wanted to also mention that, you know, in this process, word got out that we were getting feedback. Um, I, I'm sure some of you might have gotten calls, but I actually got several phone calls and a lot of feedback. And I just thought it was valuable for me to mention that people were very passionate about Jack Emmett and their, their value of what it meant for them to grow up there. I got calls from several gentlemen that had grown up in that facility, or I should say in the area. They've moved away. They hear that there's, you know, things going on there, and they just wanted to share with me what it meant to them as a child. I heard a lot of that and a lot of historical information, and I just thought that from a community standpoint, that was really nice to hear, that, that there's value added to our, what we're providing, not just to Jack M yet, but the commons. You know, I'd like to think that kids are saying the same thing about the commons in 20 years' time or at Northwoods or at Kerr Street. So we heard a lot of that. They grew up there. This is what we did as kids. A lot of the older generation that live in the neighborhood said, I took my kids there. Now I take my grandkids there and on and on and on. So let me mention something as well, because I got some of those calls that probably called you afterwards. Okay. Um, in some cases, it was a thought that there would be nothing there, period. So we need to clear that up. In other cases, it was a thought that there would be no gymnasium there. And we need to get, make sure that the public understands that you know, the possibilities exist for a gymnasium. And we will have some kind of functionality. Uh, we will have a recreation center at that, that place. Yeah, I mean, my, my response to them is I appreciated their feedback. I'm not the decision makers in it, so whatever right. does go back is obviously, um, you know, sits at this table. Uh, but um, I, I, it's important to us. We want to provide programs and services. Right. We do. It's important to us. That facility means a lot. But I was mentioning really that because that. what happened, I got, I got calls that they were, there was a fear that there was going to be no recreation center. And then I got other calls that said, based on what they thought or the information that they received, that there would be no gymnasium. And that's not a final decision at this point. So I just want to make that clear. <clears throat> Um, and Mr. Bittner, this is to your um, question. We did want to find out who lived, um, who, who responded. Um, 30, 31 to 40 um, is the top person that basically filled out the majority of those surveys. And when I look at this, and you certainly can glean your own information, it tells me that we have lots of parents and kids basically from 5 to 14, <laughs> living at home with them in the area. And then it jumps to the older adults, to the 61, because as you can see, the 11% goes straight up underneath until eight, under 5. So we have a, a lot of kids from the way I look at this, and their parents are between 30 and 40. And we do have an older population. We do have an older population of that uh, 61 plus. Um, and then you can see it goes on uh, down the line there, so 25, 30. 40, 20, that sort of thing. Um, and then that was pretty much it. We wanted to find out where they lived. Majority of it was in zone one. Obviously, that's where we went door to door. There's a few that got into zone three, which was fine. Um, zone five and then a couple in zone two um, and then 12. I think a lot of those might have been from the um, social media or people um, got wind of it and took the survey because either they lived here or they used to live here or their dad, parents live here or, or, or. So I think the survey link did make it out to other people to take um, additionally to our door to door. But th that represents all the surveys, all 406. It does. Right? Yeah, so we went door to door primarily in and the so area on. with the 38%. Yes, sir. Um, so really, that's it for the surveys. That's the results. Um, I, I really, you know, uh, what I'd really like to do, and I talked with Dr. Woodruff, is basically get a, uh, an authorization from council to just move forward. We have John Sawyer is the one that did the uh, uh, initial report on the building and letting us know the damage and the costs related to that. If, if I have your authorization, I'd like to move forward with John Sawyer possibly to develop a couple of concept plans on what we might be able to put out there based on the data. Uh, that was the biggest reason we wanted the data so we could see what is it the patrons want and what do we want to move forward with, with um, putting back there. Let me ask you a question yes, sir. before we go further on this. Uh, your participation from this area at other facilities right now, is that working out or what? 
Um, you understand my question? Not in regards to basketball. If you'll yeah. recall, I, you know, in addition to, you know, obviously the schools and our volleyball, but the indoor athletic sports we've taken, uh, we've had to cut. We've had to reduce services completely. Um, How many people is that involved? Oh, gosh. Um, well, in whole, because of the storm, we cut half. So we went from 20, 50 teams to 25 teams just in basketball. Now, that's not completely related, but I will say that in this league alone that plays at this site, we probably lost seven to eight teams of the little ones. Um, we have lost our youth night program completely because we don't have another gym facility. So those teenage teenagers that are uh, participating Monday through Friday um, is probably on a yearly basis a couple hundred kids. I would give give or take 100 to 150. The mentoring programs. We have GED, mentoring programs. GED programs. What we what we have been able to absorb is the after <coughs> school program, which is you know certainly important to us, and our summer day camp team program. And we have 45 you know in both of those programs. We've had to eliminate most of our toddler programs that was at at that site. So are you really ready to go to an architect with this? Uh, we, it seems to me like you still have some lack of clarity as far as what you want to offer there. Well, if I have a facility, I can offer yeah. anything. I just don't know. I, it's not a matter of what I can I offer. You it's a matter of around whatever programs you intend to do there other than just build something and then hope you are able to situate programs there. Well, to be yeah. honest, I would probably go back to offering our after school program, our summer day camp program, our basketball and our volleyball. Those are four major programs that have been impacted completely. Yeah, we know what kind of facility we we're building in terms of size. Yeah, sure. Is four it going to be a full size basketball court, a walking trail, sure. a running trail, and office meeting rooms and so on? That dictates the kind of size what we're talking about. I, th I think um, you know an architect could tell us two ideas, one with a gym and one without a gym. I can operate out of a multi-purpose space and still provide the sum, summer day camp and, and after school program. I, I don't agree with you on that. I think what you need, you need to figure out what you're going to offer there first and then, then let your architect build around what we want, not let the architect give us plans and us build around what we want. Okay. And also, I would like some more information like town center, if you can go to town yeah. center. I mean, we provide that information out of Sandy Run Apartments, so we should be able to get some demographic information from them, at least of age groups. Also, if, I wonder if you could get it from the school system about the kids that feed into that community to the other schools from Oslo County Public Schools. And you got programs that are going on there now that, you know, the splash pad, I guess, is open yet? This weekend. This weekend, okay. And how many, how many baseball teams are playing on that field now, softball or baseball? You still have quite a few? Yep. That, that field is used, yes, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, your concession stand, isn't that fairly new there? Uh, no, sir. We don't have a concession stand there. What? No concession stand. The restrooms aren't open yet, but it's not a concession stand. We're just finishing building some new restrooms out there. Just restrooms. Yes. And the gym, I mean, uh, do we have any idea if, if a gymnasium is what we want to put there? Do we have any idea what the cost would be to upfit something that would be regulation as you were talking about? I mean, these are things that we need to know. Uh, I, I can show you what I had brought to you on the other facilities that we went and looked at. The one in Goldsboro was, you know, regulation size. I could show you some of the other research that we had done in the past on the regulation size. Yeah, I, th I, think, I think we really need to know what we're... What, I what think direction we want to go in. Council's got to decide what they want then, what we can afford to. I'm of the opinion we need another gym somewhere. Now, right. whether yeah. it's at Jack M. Inn or where, I don't know, but we need another gym. We cut <laughs> we cut toddler programs, we cut uh, youth basketball. We need another gym. We need another court somewhere. Yeah. And the other thought is, too, we don't know what the future of New River is. We really don't. That's kind of something that's up there in flux right now, too. It is it better to do it there? Would it be better to do it there, or would it be better to move it like more towards, uh, say, Bryn Mawr or somewhere like that, where you might get more participation? You know, I think we need a I think we need a, a community center minimum there. Oh yeah, definitely. definitely, uh, definitely. You know, again, my question is, I'm not sure where the gym needs to go. Let you me know, would we would we be better spending our money to uh, to to add another court? Basketball court to to the commons. Can we do that? Is that possible? 
Let me ask you a question. Um, just lost. I'm sad. Keep on talking. I'll come back around. <laughs> well, and to your uh, uh, point, Mr. Warden, we do have um, in CIP identified additional basketball space because we do. We were at a deficit for indoor yeah. we, basketball we, we, space no before Florence ever right. hit. So right. to your no absolutely, question. whether it goes here or somewhere else, it, I think it's still something needs to be looked at. Who we'll utilize um, that baseball field? Well, we have our um, high school and we have a, a men's league. Okay, mm -hmm. I guess they're, most of those are coming from outside the community, are. They correct? come from Wilmington and all over. So, Carolina Men's League plays on a regular basis there, great. and then our high schools play there. And one thing I look at that area, it's, like, it's really the center of the city. In a lot of ways, the center. Where's and that from? That, that Jack Amiet area, when you was doing the different zones, mm -hmm. it was in the center of that zone. Geographical. Real quick question, just, just to satisfy my curiosity here. Wooden Park which is further more moving towards Bryn Mawr. Yes, sir. Uh, do, is there any additional acreage there? We have the Jacksonville Volunteer Fire Department, Department, Department behind, behind it. it. Yes, we, got that, we got that built. I still don't know what we're doing with that piece of property. We've had that property for so long, and I've not heard it. Staff bring us any sort of suggestion what to do with that. Right now, it's, it's being used. The, the, Property on Country Club? Yeah, no, 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 we're talking no, about no, 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 the Jacksonville Volunteer Fire Department. Actually, the Fire Department and the Parks Department use both of those buildings. Fire Department, I think, uses the larger building, which was known more as a rescue squad facility. They use it for some training. Am I correct, Sean? Yes, we use it for some training. We're able, it's a large enough warehouse-style space. We're able to build different layouts in there to run our guys through different rescue evolutions. While, while we have it. And the smaller building behind that, the parks, the parks first, facility. First I've heard we were using the facility. Yeah, we've been using it for probably a year. Probably I did, um, two years. I did look at it actually for possibly pickleball <laughs> <laughs> and possibly, you know, to see if there was something we could do with basketball. But there's challenges to that facility and it doesn't work for either one of those. But I I was Johnny on the spot to see if we could utilize it for anything <laughs> that would suit our needs with indoor space. I'm not trying to shoot shoot this out front of New River right? because I mean I grew up in the New River part over there, you know, playing ball at Jack Hamiet, uh, playing in basketball at, all of us. at Jack Hamiet also. Uh, but you know, with the limited amount of money that we have to work with nowadays, and we've been talking about trying to put something in Brenmar Country Club area. You know, over in those areas, uh, in like in uh, your particular mm -hmm. ward over there, you know, maybe it's time to to make that uh, or consider it. Not necessarily do it, but at least uh, consider it. One of the things I do want that to mention direction. too, because we we talk about economic development. Mm -hmm. If we take some, a gym out of that area, we could probably end up killing that going forward. Just to mention it, because we need to start looking at investing in that area and not taking it out of that. That's, that's, if that's we do something thing. grand in there, right. uh, it could be an economic incentive for new housing and, development. And then we're talking oh, about opportunity different. zones as well. So but if you don't have, I have is we don't have the space there. I, I would like to find out what we can put in that space. Well, I mean, we don't really have we don't really have the space to put a in my mind a, a, a nice regulation size gym. We got a ball field. Right. You know, we can rep replicate a ball field any other place, but you can't do it in everywhere. Okay, I think I think we definitely need some sort of community center. I wouldn't mind I wouldn't mind having uh, some concepts, you know, on, on a community center. Even if you do make some some sort of a, I don't know, a multi-use space as sure. part of it. I I think I'd like to get some programs back in that area as soon as possible. And I and well, I'm it looked not like sure that, it, yeah, it looked like that was more the demand than anything. Yeah, I think so too. I think there's a need in that area for programs, and we need to get we need to get something sooner rather than later on the programs. But I'm concerned about when this survey went out, and like I said, you haven't we haven't even really looked at the, the sheer numbers and the ages when it comes to the census tract. Two, five and under are the ones that's primarily overlooked. So we don't even know that number. And we also talk, not talking about right now, but we're talking about going into the future. So I, I think there's other things we need to consider and look at as well prior to making these decisions. But we could see what fits there. That's what I would like to do is see what can fit in that area. That's what I'm, I'm thinking. I think, 
I'm thinking we're looking at just some sort of a community center to go back there, I think, based on the footprint. But but again, I'm I'm I may be wrong. That's why I'd like to see some sort of concept. Yeah, that's what that that would work. That's what me, I'd like to, to see. To be able to see what can fit in True. that way. And we could yeah. we could come up with different ideas about what can go there. I would like for you to think about what you want to put in there first and then determine what size, what size footprint that would involve and you know but but I would hate for you to spend money on, on a on a design that you can't use. I think a lot of it for us depends on gym or no gym. I can we will fill it up and utilize either one. So I can certainly come back to you and give you a list of programs that we're we were going to provide in that facility on based off of those two options. I mean, I I, um, I certainly have no problem doing that. And I totally agree with Mr. Ward. I mean, the, the, at the least, there needs to be a community. You know, some kind of community. Sure. Yeah, Multi-purpose space, so, very similar yeah. to what the schools have, and we've talked about that. You know, we have uh, we utilize after-school programs, and they all have a very large multi-purpose space. Mm -hmm. um, we can certainly look at that, and then I can we can program that to the hill if we have a gym. And I don't know if a gym will fit. Honestly, I, I really don't know. I think you know uh, uh, one idea that an architect could come back and say is you can't put one regulation-wise. Anyways, it's not even possible, but. Um, you know, if we have that, then that just opens the possibilities on those programs as well. So, let me mention something else. Yesterday, I was actually riding over just to look at Jack Amia, and I ended up going by Clyde Irwin because a, a group AAU group was in that facility. And fortunately, you know, I think it was Mr. Uh, Jordan who actually works for Clyde Irwin, but he also Dave worked. Jordan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he works for Boys Boys and Girls Club too. He also works for us, I think. Yeah. Oh wow, he's all <laughs> over the place. But they had a, a, a bunch of kids, but they had more adults. And one of the things that they were talking about the need for gymnasiums around the area, and they were they they were talking about the need for it in that area. And they weren't even living in that area. No one that was in that area in that room lived in the area, but they agreed with the, the possibility of a gym being there. So I think it's more information we need to gather. But I like the idea of the concepts that can actually fit there. Sure. You know. Well, what will fit there? You know, I think we all agree that that we need more more gymnasium space somewhere, whether it's there or somewhere. But we need some more. That's once we take care of Jackie M yet and find out, you know, does a does a basketball court fit there? If it doesn't, then that becomes our next priority for the recreation. And I'm in my mind, where can we where can we create some more indoor opportunities for, for recreation. Well, you got a ball field there that I understand a lot of it is league yes. teams from not even any area, right? No, they come in from all over. They love that field. Well, um, I understand that, yeah. but uh, it's easier to build another ball field than it is uh, to try to cram a community center into a limited space. Okay. I'd, I'd rather see us if we had to expand it to that ball field area build the ball field someplace else and use that space okay it's all about use mm -hmm. and i don't think i'm not comfortable just having an architect give us his concepts or her <coughs> or her <laughs> 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 I hope she have should do a good job. <laughs> oh, of course. So, do you have some idea of what where our expectations are? No. Uh, no we're we're giving her some mixed. We'll, uh, <laughs> Y'all talking? We'll, we'll, re we'll review <laughs> we'll, what options we, you know we can move forward with. And one thing I want to I want to bring up too is that we have a area called Camp Johnson that has a lot of young men over there without facilities. And as we build our relationships with the base, that's something we might need to consider also when it comes to uh, space over there. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions on any of the survey, by all means, let me know. I'm happy to answer any other further questions or whatever needs to happen. Thank you very much. Good work. Well. Thank you. No yeah. Thank you. Mr. Massey, do you have anything else? No, that's the last item on the agenda. <laughs> I'm going to song and dance moment. to call you by our next 60 minutes? Yeah. Let, let's have a motion to adjourn. How's that? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you.